It's the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers. I'm talking today with Levni Yilmaz. He's an independent filmmaker whose animated series Tales of Mere Existence has racked up millions of views on YouTube. Before we get to Lev, I want to tell you about a free resource for comedy writers or anyone interested in the craft of comedy writing. It's howtowritefunny.com. Check it out. There's tons of tips and resources. There's free ebooks that can help in your comedy, whatever level uh, you might be at with your work. You can find motivation, prompts, best practices. And if you sign up for the How to Write Funny email list, you'll be alerted to all kinds of comedy opportunities and insider information on the comedy business that I'm sure you're going to love. Check it out at howtowritefunny.com. So Lev, I've seen a lot of your videos on your YouTube channel but don't know a lot else about your work. Why don't you start by sort of catching me up and listeners on what kind of work you do and what kind of work you've done? Uh, well, it's been a comic and animation series called Tales of Mere Existence. Uh, I've been doing it for several years now. It's really just taking stories that are kind of based on my thoughts probably based on my thoughts more than based on specific events. An event will spark things off, but just to kind of capture bits of my attitude, the the way that I will look at things, a lot of times the way that I'll look at things when I recognize that it's kind of ridiculous, uh, self-defeating, self-destructive like that, that's mostly what it's all about. And it's been series of videos that have been on your YouTube channel and anywhere else? I first started getting known because of the YouTube channel, and that still has sort of been the mainstay. But I wanted to um, to expand upon that. I started doing comics as well. And so now that I, I do them both, it's the same character. And uh, that uh, I have the stuff on YouTube, of course, but then also like on a couple of Facebook pages, I've got like my personal one and I've got another one that really is just about the work and also on on Tumblr. And I do post stuff to Twitter, but I mean, I just, I really don't like using Twitter at all. And so I, sometimes I forget to update that one, but it's, um, you know, just putting putting the stuff out there however you get to the honey. <laughs> Yeah, and have you gotten on TV with any of the cartoons? Oh yeah, yeah. That um, it, erratically, you know, that it's uh, been little bits here, little bits there. Like that, uh, I was on a show on um, on Comedy Central, a Comedy Central pilot once. Had some stuff on Showtime, and I'm sure there's another one I'm forgetting. But um, most recently, that there's a channel in Argentina around in uh, in that whole area called ISAT, and that they've um, Last couple of months, they did a, a full, I think, half hour, maybe even an hour of my videos. Uh, just had this full levathon. Translated? Uh, subtitles. Subtitles, subtitles okay. yeah. Cool. And then you do film festivals on occasion as well, right? Um, I used to do film festivals. I've kind of stopped. I mean, I, I do it here and there when people ask me, but it just doesn't seem to... Um, I've really amped up making a lot more work, and so I, I don't want to be away from home, keeping me from doing it quite as often. And it's such an inefficient way to distribute work nowadays. Before the internet, it was the only way to get people to see yeah. your movies. Yeah. But now it's like, yeah, you have to travel somewhere and spend all this time and money, and you're going to show it to like a room of 200 people. <laughs> like, why not put it online? It's so much easier. But the, the thing is, though, that uh, there is something really wonderful that happens, though, like at those festivals. First off, I mean, you you don't wind up with a great deal of life memories from like posting shit on YouTube. That is true. But I do have like a great number of memories from like going and doing festivals. I mean, that was it was a hell of a lot of fun. I, I met some people. But also once people make that personal connection, you know, that yeah, I saw this guy's short films, and then later on, he like stumbled and spilled a drink on me, you know. And then they'll remember you a little bit better that way. Yeah, and obviously that's the, the big thing of festivals. And it's funny. Why do you suppose that is? You go to a film festival and see somebody's short film, they remember it and they call you because they have that personal connection. They might have seen the same film on YouTube, but they're not going to call you. Well, because that, um, especially now, because that uh, YouTube is such an exceptionally large and clogged rabbit hole. I mean, you just don't have that same kind of direct connection. 
You know, it's it's uh, YouTube is is uh, seems to be tied to people spending um, like frittering a great deal of their day away. But I mean, going and seeing a festival, it's an event. It's something you did and you are going to remember it. Yeah. So how often do you do a new uh, animated video? Uh, about every two weeks. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a pace. Mm. Are they animated or do they? Because your style is very idiosyncratic. It looks like it's being drawn. How do you how do you do that? Why don't you explain to us sort of we are at the production? It's I, I took the technique from a um, from a movie called the uh, the mystery of Picasso that uh, that was made I think in the fifties where uh, Picasso painted on translucent canvases and then um, then it was uh, shot from the other side. Yeah, well, there's that famous photograph I've seen where he's waving some sort of light, and they snap the photo with a long uh, shutter speed. Yeah. So you can see the trail of the thing. This I didn't is, know there was like a series of him doing that. No, there was this, this movie, movie. I think it's it. about it's about an hour long. Um, that uh, I've the the name of the director escapes me right now. But it was uh, when I saw it, it was I thought it was just stunning, fascinating, and he painted a hell of a lot slower than I thought he did. But I I, I mixed that just with like this short film that a guy I knew in college made. Uh, where he was just drawing a picture and he was talking in this very um, this very particular way and just talking about something that was bugging him and he was just like doing this doodle on a piece of paper and I just I thought that was great and so putting the two of those things together but also I mean like a, a huge part of it was just uh, the the approach and the attitude just I think came so much from uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions I just I loved reading this novel that was just uh that could be that was both it, i mean it was very serious and it was also very absurd but then like he was telling it in this way that it almost i was reading it and i heard a voice in my head that almost sounded a little bit like a third grader just sort of describing things that were going on without really any great emotional connection to it and then saying and then this happened and it looked like this and every once in a while i'll still sort of I'll still do that in an episode. I'll say it looked like this, and that was that's just completely like you know me. Um, um, you could call it aping. You could call it paying tribute. But whatever the reason, that book was a very big deal to me. And was that the first Vonnegut book you had read? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you've probably sucked up a lot of the others. Yes. At this point, that uh, a lot of them really can sort of run into each other a little bit. But w one of the ones that I think I read and reread, and um, even though I don't think he liked the book very much, I really, I really connected with Dead Eye Dick. I really liked Dead Eye Dick a lot. <laughs> Maybe if only. I think there's a wonderful line in there somewhere where where he says something like, "That is my basic complaint about life. It's far too easy to make really horrible mistakes." <laughs> Great. My my um, special book of his is Sirens of Titan. For uh -huh. whatever reason, not that that's uh, relevant <laughs> at all to this conversation, but I just thought I'd share. I haven't read that in a little while, and so I think that maybe I should give it another whirl. Um, I'll have to give Dead Eye Dick another another try. So. Tell us then how how you do that process because um, the videos look really cool and it does look like your hand drawing, but it doesn't look like the same kind of hand drawing. Is it animated or is it like live action drawing? It really is live action drawing. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's really no animation happening. No, but I mean that um, I found it. I found it to be very beneficial to just call it animation. Everybody else does, and uh, just for the for the pure reasons of having an elevator pitch. Because I mean, like, how the fuck else are you going to describe it? Saying like, "Well, I sort of do this thing that's drawing, and I'm telling a story at the same time, and it's a little bit, uh, you know, it looks a little shitty here and there." And da da da. I mean, if there's if you call it animation, then people are like, Duh, "Okay, animation." I well, know. it elevates it in a way too, because it makes it seem like a lot more time and effort went into it. Because it takes so long, and the fact that you can do one every two weeks is a, that's going to astound anyone who thinks you're animating it frame by frame. Well, um, frankly, I think that there's something about the fact that I mean, it looks a little, it looks a little r low rent. I mean, I still think it looks a little shitty, and I think that there's something about that that really and truly helps the story come across, and um, that. The, the metaphor that I tend to use for why I think um, it helps the story is if you compare Gollum 
to Kermit the Frog, which is that I think if you're watching one of the Lord of the Rings movies, you're looking at Gollum, that there's part, your, part of your brain is just kind of like going like that, uh, oh, wait a second, that little bit, the way they animated that wrong, that doesn't really look all that real. Uh, like that, wow. Um, and even like that somebody who's not a very sophisticated viewer can say like, oh man, that really looks fake, and da, 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 like that. But if you've got Kermit the Frog, just a hand in a sock, and you're just, you're looking at that, there's part of your brain, the critical part of your brain turns off immediately. And that it will, the imagination will kick in and it will just accept that this thing is alive. And I think that having this thing that looks sort of like anybody could do it, it all of a sudden, like anybody's criticisms of the production values are going to go straight out the window. That's sort of been my, my theory of, of how and why that works. It's a great theory. Uh, are you aware of Matt Fraction and his work in comics? Ah, shit. I know, the, I, I know the name, and I think that if you, if you showed it to me, I would know it. Yeah, probably. So he used to work at an amazing animation company in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And he was explaining to me that they actually have done studies with like computer animation mimicking human or animal movement, mm -hmm. if it got to be like 99.9% .9 perfect or accurate, it was actually more creepy to people than it was, you know, connecting with them as realistic. Mm -hmm. But if you scale it way back to like 40% accurate, mm -hmm. um, but if it's actual, you know, human or animal movement, such as a sock or a puppet or whatever, that connects with people so much more powerfully because it be it's a representation mm -hmm. of reality. And people are so much more adept at recognizing a representation, even if it's only 40% accurate, mm -hmm. than they are representing an artificial copy that's 99% accurate. They connect with it on a, on a more emotional level because it's a real, there's so much subtlety to the way a real hand moves and nuance that you can actually connect with that better. So you're, you're totally onto something. Well, I was also fascinated with, uh, my, my brother works in animation also and like with, um, and motion he capture. did a lot with motion capture. Yeah. Right. And he was, um, he was showing me some, um, some experiments and, uh, some perception experiments a long time ago. And there was something that really connected with me a lot, which was that uh, he was um, just showing a, it was a screen and there were only like five points of, um, of reference, like on, on a person. Like, you know, I think that there was like a, a, a dot on the head, one on like each arm and like one on each foot and somewhere, somewhere in the torso. And you watch these things move and you absolutely like knew this is a guy and he's walking and you can see him walking and you can even identify what kind of walk he's doing. If he's walking in a way that looks confident or if he's looking, if he's walking in like sort of a posture of defeat. With just dots. With just dots. And you can absolutely get it. And I, I geek out about that sort of thing. <laughs> I, I love that sort of thing. And you used to work in that field as well, right? Yeah. Although, I mean, I was um, that... Uh, I was, I didn't really do that much of the, uh, of the animating. I was more of a, um, you know, I did like the sound mixing here and there. I did, um, I did the lip sync, uh, the, the lip sync animation, which was, um, really a fun thing to do. So I, you're talking about moving the lips so they match the audio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, which is funny because like, then you start thinking about words, uh, if you do it a lot and like, you know, for several, you know, like maybe about a six hour stretch a day, you're thinking about words entirely phonetically. And so therefore you get good at it, but it really, it sends your spelling straight to hell. Right. Right. Would you do that with a program that, yes. was, that had like eight different mouth sizes or whatever? And then mm -hmm. you would, it would, the computer would actually... Uh, program so you had to type out dialogue then or you i wouldn't enter i wouldn't type it it was just read like the that, sound file well like for instance um like that the the mouth movement uh your your mouth is going to be roughly in the same uh position if you say a c d g or k or um and it's going to be in the same position if you're saying like a or i or like an F or a V, those are all going to be the same. And so you just start to, uh, that I can like listen to, or I could, I mean, I haven't done it in a while, but um, you could listen to a, um, a person saying something and you would know roughly where the, the phonetic targets would go. 
So your work in sound there obviously was a huge uh, boon to you when you started doing your own movies, because as I'm sure you know, like you said, your your picture almost has a purposeful, low-tech vibe. Good audio always saves bad picture, but good picture can't save bad oh, audio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That pe- people just put uh, bad, bad audio, people just simply will not put up with it. But, I mean, you can learn that within <laughs> talking about film festivals again. You go to any film festival, especially if it's like a... Uh, if it's like not a, an especially professional one, I mean, pff, you'll learn that in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So tell us how you transitioned from doing that kind of work to making your own movies. Um, well, I had done, um, I had done like a whole bunch of, um, short films like in college and directly after college, like a few years before I, um, I uh, got that job at the animation studio. I mean, I'm the ultimate little brother, my big brother, like, you know, was working in an animation studio and, um, like he had a, a, a decent, uh, a position there, a really good position there. Um, and you know that, and I was the little brother who was just kind of like, um, uh, can you get me a job there? <laughs> and, and so, like you know, I came on as like a production assistant. And um, what kind of movies had you made? Um, I was um, I was doing a lot of stuff that was um, uh, I was trying to do uh, adult comedy things in sort of a Sesame Street format. And like I worked a lot with puppets. Okay. Um, and uh, so I was, I was doing things like that in college. I was doing stuff that was actually a lot like um, I was really influenced by the Momenshans and I was trying to do stuff that was, uh, that was very black and white, like super Teutonic looking and um, just trying to find these abstract ways of telling stories. I mean that, um, oh God, I mean, I, I probably, you probably have to like, you know, give me half a bottle of vodka to make me watch one of those things again. A couple of the short ones were good, but when I tried to bring it to a long format, you know, I just flailed. I was there with that. Uh, I, I really don't, I don't think very much of them anymore, but I mean, obviously they were a very big part of the development. So, you know, that, are they supposed uh, to be funny? Um, occasionally that occasionally that they were, they were funny, but, um, but, uh, but I mean, I was, I was an art student and like that, uh, and art students, you know, you have this, I, a lot of times I would, I would try to do things that were funny, but I mean, you kind of get swept away of, every once in a while, like, you know, trying to say something important, which a lot of times can be, um, can be the death of, you know, death of anything. Yeah. You start getting preachy or pretentious and absolutely your, your audience is gone. <laughs> yeah. But I mean that, I think that, um, that probably in almost any medium, you, you, you sort of have to, or it can be beneficial to go through a very pretentious period just so that you can hang your head in shame afterwards and promise yourself never to do it again. Yeah, you learn a lot about what not to do in that period. And then yeah. you work in this professional environment yeah. um, where you work on a variety of things. And then when do you start doing your own movies after that? Well, um, I think that uh, that the first episode of, of, um, of Tales was really just... Um, I had uh, I diddled around with that technique before, and I'd used it before, uh, but um, it was really just like maybe about ten blocks away from here on Twenty Fourth Avenue. Um, I was uh, woke up with a hangover, and I just um, just did a little short movie about like that the party I'd gone to the night before. You see, when I when I first moved to San Francisco, I didn't know anybody except my brother, and he was uh, living with a woman, so that he that he eventually married and said like he didn't really have a great deal of time to pal around and so i was like that i was in the city and i i didn't know anybody and i didn't have anything to do except to, to go to work and so i well i r- was trying to you know find my place here and so that i would just um carried a notebook around me with me everywhere i went and I just to try to ke- and i would draw little comics in there and just say what i did on any various day just to keep myself company and then um, just this day I woke up with a hangover and just made this little short movie about what I had done the night before. And uh, then I did another one. And What did you do with that movie? Was there internet at this point? I did, uh, I put it put it out, I think, as a quick time movie. And yeah, because would this have been like the late 90s or early to The early zeros, I'm pretty early sure. Early zeros, yeah. so um, yeah, web video was pretty rare. It was like you would have to download a 
real time player or a quick time movie mm -hmm. <laughs> player. And it's kind of a complicated thing but you managed to somehow figure out how to put it online yeah and um that uh, pre-youtube you know that uh i mean the, the way that it's always gone for me is just like that um that i'll sort of like sit you know as in a, a state of latency in a in a cocoon for a little while i'll still be, keep on making stuff but things will just uh will be low-key for a little while and then you know something will happen, and then there will be an explosion. And th there was an explosion um, at one point, actually before uh, before YouTube, like that. Uh, there was several of them, actually. I think but just these little little uh, ripples that happened uh, every once in a while, of where like a lot of people would be looking at my stuff, and then um, and then would go to sleep, and then it would wake up, and it would go to sleep, and, it's, and it happened like that uh, a bunch of times. Um, but I think that in the pre YouTube days really i think that a lot of people and a lot of people were just sitting around saying like that okay well there's the flash player there's this quick time player the real media player the pulse player whatever it was and a lot of people were just sort of sitting back and i was one of them just saying all right well let's just kick back and wait until wait until we wait until somebody wins the war and then youtube came along and i think it was maybe about two or three months before it said, I think that somebody won the war, you know? <laughs> Clearly, yeah. We yeah. don't even talk about the, like the Windows media player. Nobody even knows what that is anymore. <laughs> Thank God. And so you were really just doing your own thing for your own reasons. And you weren't trying to like build a brand or do a thing or, you know, build a fan base or anything necessarily, but it was just sort of happening. Um, pretty much. I mean, like that, uh, I certainly, I mean, I had, um, I think like anybody would, I mean, you had, you, you do have thoughts when you do have um, moments where, where people are starting to really pay attention. You do have thoughts of, well, what could I do with this? You do have those thoughts, but um, certainly uh, one of those lessons that I think that you learn and you frequently have to relearn it and then relearn it again and then uh, remind yourself again is just that when you're thinking too much strategically about what to do, it's possible that it'll help you out, but uh, the work is probably not going to be very good if you're if you're doing that. And um, this, I don't know if this is everybody or if this is just me, but um, I am absolutely at my worst when I'm trying to reach more people. And I really don't make very good work. I think that um, my mindset is and probably should, and I think it sort of remains at its best, I think that when I'm only thinking about um, uh, doing work for for like for a smaller audience, if more people get into it, that's totally fine. But um I, I like thinking that way just because that's the sort of stuff that I think that I uh, was kind of brought up on. And that was the whole thing that I personally connect with. Uh, and maybe it's just because I was, um, I was so into, you know, I was just so into like um, the way that a lot of indie bands did things for themselves, by themselves, like that a lot of music that I think I probably listened to um, uh, like in the, in in the early 90s like maybe late 80s or something i think that before um before grunge really hit <laughs> i think that uh there was this whole there was this the, the whole diy culture was something i just that just meant so much to me and it was because because people were just making their own thing and they just didn't give a shit about what was going on outside of it and that's the um that's the mindset that uh that i connect the most with even though that it's it's a little bit strange now because um, that uh, um, the attitude is, has been has been appropriated in just a lot of really shitty ways I think over the years but I mean that uh, but still the root of that and the thought of that even though that um, that what might have been created at, at that time um, has been commercialized to no end still like i mean the uh there's something very pure about the ad the initial attitude in itself i think even though that on, maybe, your, on your work 
I'm, no, I'm, I'm mostly I'm talking about any independent absolutely um, yeah project yeah. yeah well that's interesting because that's when I think of okay you've got this thing that's maybe building a little bit of a fan base it's getting mm-hmm. popular I I wouldn't think maybe a lot of people would but I wouldn't think about changing the thing because that's clearly what's working I would start thinking about well how can I get more eyeballs on it or mm-hmm. how can I get in, into another media that's maybe um, going to have more people checking on it like you know other platforms or tv or whatever yeah and i feel like that that's more how things work now if something happens that's that's popular and good it's all about how to use some business strategy to get that scene more or to build the fan base more the old way of doing it was oh it's getting a fan base now then let's recast it and let's get a professional artist in here to, you know, mm-hmm. do it up and let's make the, uh, the topics a little more, uh, broad. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, <laughs> in the old days when there were very few platforms, you kind of had to do that because the audience was so huge and broad for every TV station or mm-hmm. whatever. It's funny that you were still in that mindset in the, in the thousands, but I guess that's, that's kind of how things still were before video happened online. Mm-hmm. But you opted not to. You wisely decided to just keep doing what you were doing and not change the product in order to get more fans or to try to monetize it in some way. Occasionally, you know, that um, occasionally I kind of wonder if it's been good for me to try just so I can see it as being a mistake afterwards. But also just that it kind of gives me more material because when you, because I, I almost sort of think about it of like, you know, changing your work to try to reach a larger audience or something like that. It's, it's pretty similar to, um, you know, if you were in high school and you're trying to like, you know, dress in a certain way or talk about certain things or go out for a team so you can sit at the cool kids lunch table, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of similarities between those two things. Sure. And, you know, so I think that it might be good for me to fuck up every once in a while and try doing that just so that like, you know, I can kind of go back to my own mindset with a great deal more, uh, conviction. Interesting. Yeah. So what does that mean for you? You're, you're, um, I, I almost called them cartoons. I'm just going to call them cartoons. Call them whatever uh, you want. Your, I really don't care. <laughs> your, your, your videos, your cartoons seem very personal and very genuine. And when you say sort of change them to make them appeal to a wider audience, do you mean hitting subject matter that may be more relatable to a larger audience? Or do you mean stepping outside yourself and trying not to make them so personal, but more general? Um well, I mean, I'm always flopping back and forth between those two things. And I mean, ch- just because uh, it just sort of, it depends so much on what I'm thinking about. Um, but what's really, what's really funny and really kind of a drag too, is that um, I have uh, talked with many people who are, um, who are sort of like experts in how to make, how to make more people watch your video. And oh, yeah, there's um, a ton of that. Yeah, and uh, but that um, you know, I've talked to people who are talking about how to maximize views and this and that, and everything that they tell me to do is something I don't want to do, you know, and, and um, that everything that they tell you to do is something that I usually just plain refuse to do. I mean, that uh, that people um, they'll tell you'd like to talk more about um, celebrities or talk about sex or uh, well, I mean. Apple products. That, there are a few things, things that, that, really, that are that, really going to uh, hit. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the thing is, is, I mean, you can still talk about sex as long as you just hit it from a different angle, you know, and uh, or, or hit it from an unusual angle. Because, I mean, that... Um, because that is still going to be a subject for human beings, um, you know, long after, you know, like talking about you know the kardashians is you know exactly so yeah uh, there's definitely some benefits to it yeah (laughs) but um but yeah i mean like talk talking about like um movie reviews or whatever and and these these are the only like being part of the current the 24-hour news cycle or the current events cycle in some way but i think that the um and i was just having a, a conversation with somebody about this uh the other day and this this has just sort of been my 
this has been my thought on this um, uh, ever since like you know web video really started taking hold was just um, I don't really I don't get why so many people who like there here is an opportunity to really like um, to kind of like say what you think about things to you know say who you are to really give your thoughts about life in general. I mean, why would you want to do something that's about like a, a, a something that's in the mass culture that what you're doing is like, you might be getting attention for doing something about this thing in the mass culture, but you're still, you're feeding it. And uh, you, you are doing something that's very much in service to, you know, uh, <laughs> this, this, like, you know, uh, um, some sort of money making thing that's put out by a giant corporation. I don't, I personally don't get it. Yeah, well, your stuff is so personable, and it does feel like a person kind of reaching out across the internet and saying, "Hey, this is my life, and this is," and it's just very honest. And I'm assuming it all is, and it's not like not of not a lot of it is uh, fabricated. <laughs> um, I mean, there there's I fabricate just enough to to turn the thing into a story, you know, and uh, that. So uh, I think that one of my favorite um, episodes over the last year was this one that was called uh, Ex-Girlfriend in the Supermarket, where um, that, <laughs> you'll never guess what it's about with that title, <laughs> and <laughs> but, but it was just about me going to the supermarket and like that my, my ex-girlfriend was standing there and just like the various thoughts I had when that was happening. And like that there were some things that, uh, um, there was some stuff that happened there that, um, that was true. And there were some things that I pulled out from other events to turn it into a story that, uh, the thing is it had to capture what I was, um, not necessarily even what I was thinking, but, uh, um, you know, what I was feeling. And so that um, putting those things together, but I mean, it, it really more or less was that, uh, that attitude. That's what I was going for, really. Yeah, no, I totally get that. It's like any novelist would do or any storyteller. Yeah. You have to get at the truth of the, the matter. Yeah. Regardless of the facts. Yes. So... <laughs> I've never heard that one before. That's a good one. Did you just make that up? I think I did. <laughs> you have yeah. to get to the truth of the matter regardless <laughs> of the facts. <laughs> so, but I can see under those circumstances that it would be really difficult for you to embrace all of the self-promotional things that people would want you to do to increase your audience and that sort of stuff. Subscribe to my channel, you know, and hey, everybody, you know what I mean? Like being a carnival barker is such a different voice than hey here's what happened in my life that's um that's very true i mean like that uh, that i did do i have been doing like bumpers at the end of the video which is which is like um absolutely like trying to get people to uh subscribe or to contribute to the patreon but the thing is is that um I I know that um that i'd feel bad about it and i don't think that it would go with the work at all um if i was to behave in a way that was contrary to my nature and um which is you know not an especially loud aggressive person you know that uh and i i think that if it um um both i would feel like an idiot if i did it but also i just i know it's contrary to my nature and it's contrary to the work to be somebody who's like um who's super in your face online and um when i see the people who are very much like you know kind of like practically got their nose to the lens um in a lot of in a lot of videos and that they're doing this thing to be in your face I know that that's popular and it works for a lot of people, but um, I am one of the people out there, one of the audience at home that's saying, please get the fuck out of my face, you know, because I would, um, I would much, because it just, to me, it just feel, doesn't, doesn't feel very genuine. And I just, uh, I have a hard time listening to uh, that many people who approach things in that way. Yeah, I'm with you there. So do you know those videos that are fairly popular now. And I think they've even done some advertisements, some commercials, but mostly they're explainer videos where it's somebody sketching and then they'll do some writing and it's all fast speed. And the camera will sort of pan from 
this drawing to that drawing. And then maybe at the end they zoom out and you see the whole... There's a n- name for that, and I forget what it's called. Uh, that that I'm not sure, but I think that that um, that a lot of that stuff was done to pretty good effect with some of those um, Robert Reich. Oh, uh, Robert Reich, the, the former the, labor secretary. Yeah, the yes, um, that's what I'm talking about. Those kind yeah. of explainer videos, though. I think aren't his a little bit more like fancy design after effects things. I'm thinking of the hand drawn cartoon explainer videos where it's black, where it's uh, like on being white. done on a whiteboard. Exactly. And it's somebody drawing, you see the hand, but they speed it up and they explain it. I feel like that's become a really popular thing in the last five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like you were doing it first, but in a much more subdued, personal way. Is that possible? Or have those things been around longer than I think? Um, Well, it's it's a fairly obvious way of telling a story. I mean that, and so it doesn't surprise me in the least um, that uh, that people have picked up on it. I mean, I mean, are you asking if they got the idea from me? I'm asking if you think they did. I don't. I don't know if I'd want to take responsibility for it. I'm. I would guess that I didn't hurt. Um, that every every once in a while, like that, I will see a um, an illustration um that uh i'm pretty sure that maybe somebody was looking at something that i did but you know what can you say i mean like that and i remember um that it, uh, maybe a couple of years back that um i got probably about 50 mails of people asking me if i narrated a ups commercial mm. and so that uh, i never saw the damn commercial and i sort of wish i did because like you know that i'm guessing that it was somebody who was um who was um, talking in that very sort of monotone way. And, yeah, no, yeah. That, that sort of thing, I think, if you see enough videos for long enough and hear a certain voice, it mm-hmm. starts to become familiar, and that's, that's the real commodity in commercial voiceovers. That's mm-hmm. why they hire famous actors to do voiceovers for commercials, and they don't even tell you who they are. They don't announce those people but you hear that voice and it's like oh i know that person that person Mm -hmm. is someone i I have very positive feelings about (laughs) so it makes total sense that they would want to mimic that since you've been doing these things for so long and so many people have seen them yeah makes good sense so you could probably make a killing in the voiceover industry if you started doing commercials (laughs) the um well i mean i'm certainly i'd i'd i would love to but i mean i think that um uh, most of the time, like when I've auditioned or tried to like, you know, get some voiceover work, then usually they get back to me and say like, no, nah, actually we want somebody with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> eh, what can you do? So once online video is a thing that's m- most people can access, yeah, your videos have already been around for a while. Um, and I assume that you, you pick up a lot more f- views how are you supporting yourself doing that? Or do you still have a job at that point when you're making a cartoon? How often are you making a, t- a cartoon at that point? Um, like by the mid to late 2000s. Oh, mid to late 2000s. Um, that, did I still have a job at that point? I was, um, God, when did that end? Um, I was doing um, some freelance work for a um, for an anim- another animation studio that was called Wild Brain. Um, they're still around. I think that they've uh, they moved from San Francisco to Los Angeles, though. And I was doing the um, the lip sync work for I did for for two kids television shows. One of them was called The Higley Town Heroes, and uh, that this other one that was uh, called Bubble Guppies. And is this like Nickelodeon or PBS or what? Is this? <laughs> to tell you the truth, I mean that I don't really know where they went i think that might have been it might have been the disney channel but oh, okay. um, but don't don't quote me on that i'm not positive i saw very few of the the completed uh episodes but higley town heroes in, in particular was um was a very charming show and uh, uh put together by um by a director i really admire uh by the name of george evil and that um and a uh, great guy and um that uh beautiful beautiful aesthetic sense. He was really, really something. But so that was sort of my main gig that, uh, when things, you know, started gaining a lot of momentum on YouTube, then, um, uh, I got, there was a lot of, um, there, there were a lot of opportunities around. I mean, I got to, I got to do a book and that I was also making a bunch of, um, videos for, for, a, a TV show in France and that was a hell of a lot of fun. And they also did that. It was great because they 
would give they would have like uh maybe about five or six filmmakers and they would give them all one subject and then they would just see how everybody dealt with it and so i would just like get a name pulled out of uh, like a word pulled out of a hat That's make great. a make a video about this subject and some of them some of them i think were some of them were were good uh definitely did a few turkeys um but there were there were a few of there that I think were some of the best episodes I ever did. Like there was one um, that's called God. I don't know if you ever saw the video Didn't called God, God but um, but I, I, I still rather like that one. That was the word? Yeah, they just said the, that was the name, like make a video about God. I'm going to so, check that one yeah, out. And, and was that subtitled also or translated? That one, I think that they, um, that one, yeah, they had, to, uh, they had somebody um, uh, redub it. How did you feel about that? Um, I was your voice is such a big part of the experience. Admittedly, like, I think that they, um, I really wish that they listened to me a little bit more about how he should have spoken it. And they were, they were saying that, uh, that when in French, that somebody who was talking in that low monotone way, that it would just sound like, you know, that, um, that everybody in France would lock away their razor blades. And I still don't believe him because I mean, like that, I mean, I've seen Alphaville. (laughs) (laughs) Who knows? They're, you know, they're still TV executives, even if they're in France, um, they probably don't know what they're talking about. But, uh, but I was just, I was still so, I was so happy to be on, on TV in France. I mean, like, I just was like, uh, I just said, okay, I'm just going to go with it and just, uh, said what they, w- what they're saying is like, you know, the right way of doing it. I mean, I'm so happy to have this gig that I'll just, um, I'll just go along with it, you know? Yeah. So what other opportunities came about once you really started catching on and building some steam doing some commercials i think was uh was something that really that certainly helped um helped financially i think that the the thing that that uh that did happen though was just so many people started like making making so many videos and and youtube is is pretty clogged at this point and so that um and and a lot of people who have been doing doing YouTube videos for a few years, I mean, have had the have had the same issues that I have. You know, that just uh, that there's so much out there that um, that y- you know you're you wind up being another fish in the pond. And um, so how do you deal with that? Um, that <laughs> is it a meritocracy? Does the good stuff still rise to the top? Um, well, the, the step one of like how to deal with that is going back and reading that onion book, the tenacity of the cockroach, frankly is um, because uh, AV club book in all fairness, but I guess, but yeah, no, you get a lot of inspiration from people telling stories of how they made it by just being incredibly persistent. It's, you know, I'm not even sure if like the, of how they made it, if that really means as much to me as like, you know, why, of just why you continue. Why you do it and uh, the continued passion for it. Yes. And I can't, I'm not even a hundred percent sure if it's, uh, if it's as much like the, the passion for the work itself, but, or, or if it is of just plain having some sort of voice, just having, having an opportunity of making any kind of con- contribution, no, no matter what it may be. You know, I think that that's, that's a, uh, that's a very large part of it, I think. So that's interesting. So you, I assume you kind of have a need to make these videos. It's like how you express yourself and connect with other people. Um, and without it, um, there'd be a big part of you missing. So it's more important to you that you just do it and keep doing it than it is looking for any like financial return or anything like that. Is that accurate? Um, well, I think that it's, it's just where I need to start, you know, and, um, I need to, um, the reasons that I'm doing something need to be, need to be pure. And, um, that, uh, and then after that, it's that uh, if I'm if I'm going down and I know I'm doing something for the right reasons, then um, then I can feel okay with that, and then I'll go and ask some questions from somebody who's considerably more savvy and smarter than me when it comes to business stuff, and I'll and I'll talk to them, you know, and uh, and just be like that. Uh, okay, like what what do you think I should do next? 
you know, and just uh, that. And sometimes they'll be right. Sometimes they'll be wrong. But I mean, I'll always walk away from it having a far better idea of what to do next. Cool. You know, so uh, let's talk a little bit about your process. Like when you have an idea for a new video or you get a word from French TV, Mm -hmm. the, the thing that kicks it off, how do you start writing it? Like, what's your process like? Well, one of the biggest, most important things to do is get out of the house and um, to just kind of go and, and just uh, think about it for for a while. And just like that, a lot of it is just writing down absolutely everything that I think about about the subject, just trying to capture what um, what my thoughts are, what and what my emotional investment is in whatever the subject might be and um trying to get a a good handle on that and then a lot of times um i mean writing does not really come all that easily to me um at all and a lot of times it really is a struggle just because um that uh, i do have that part of my brain that is um very much like trying to think, um, okay, what do people want to hear? And I just have to, and every single time I have to hammer that thing away uh, instead of like, what do people want to hear? No, actually, what do I want to say? And um, that is a, that's a constant battle. I mean, I think it's, it has a lot to do with how my brain is wired just from, I think that uh, just from my background of like that, um, I mean, my, I mean, my mom's awesome, but she absolutely was one of those people who was um, uh, who was from an era of just like of trying to be very eager, eager to please. And so, I mean, like that, that's that's in me somewhere. And so that uh, I still do have those sorts of voices in my head. So when you that's an important part of a lot of people's creative process to just pour out a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you then call through that to find the gold? Do you let it sit for a while and try to forget about it? Or do you do that right away, kind of while you're working? Like, how long does that process take for you? It, re- it can depend, like, uh, a lot from, um, from, from piece to piece. And, uh, and it always does sort of feel like a... Um, I mean, I, I wish it would get a little easier, but, I mean, it always still is kind of a battle. And sometimes, like, you know, to, uh, to get at it, I mean, that, like, I'll have to... Um, just like take whatever notes I have in my pocket and then I'll just uh, have to go out, get drunk, and then just like look at it while I'm in a um, altered state. And then I'll have a, um, and then I'll have an awful, I'll have a little bit less patience for the bullshit then. And so I'll be able to at least cross some things off. And um, then I'll uh, have a day where, with a hangover, curse myself the whole day, and then um, I'll be running out of time when I have to finish the thing, and then I'll have to pull something together one way or another. That's interesting. Let me ask you this. Do you ever sh- then show your script to other people to get feedback before you do it, or are you all internal? <sighs> no. Um, the, the only person that I really um, trust to talk about uh, an idea with is... Um, is my brother. And it's really just to talk about like um, a lot of the ideas and just and to talk about like the um, various perspectives and mostly just because, you know, that uh, being from the same family and like having a lot of similar hangups, I think that uh, talking to him will, ch- it'll just sort of clear things up a little bit and just that, and he'll usually be able to come out with something that I'm thinking about from a slightly different angle that like can, can help open things up a little bit. I'll talk with him about like, you know, concepts and ideas, but, um, with the script itself, I mean like that, that's, um, you know, he's, he's never really written from that sort of thing and said like that, uh, that, um, so I I mean, I wouldn't talk with him about it like in, from that perspective, but I mean like that, uh, when kind of formulating an idea, like absolutely. Sure. Talk talk with him about that. So then when you have a script, I assume you are then doing a production, much like an animated production where you lock the script, you record it and you make the video last. Yeah. But I mean like that, uh, but things actually work best and i'm trying to do this more because i've started to see that it really does work is that um it's almost better if i um shoot a little bit of it and just like that i find like i have a few parts that i I think that this is okay and then i'll shoot a little bit of it and then um edit that together take a look at it 
and then say like, okay, and this is starting to make sense now, and then kind of go back and go back into it. That actually works um, works a little better because like that um, because that uh, sometimes when it's just the words on the um, on the paper, it doesn't really. I might not be able to find something new, or I might not be able to find like a new angle to um, to work with worth it from and strangely enough like that uh, it's only been within the last like year or so that i started diddling around with music and um this is i I resisted it for a long time because uh i saw so many videos where like the the music just seemed to be thrown on as an afterthought and something that uh and i kind of got the impression it was something to just sort of keep people from getting bored you know, so it's, there was something constantly happening, and uh, so I didn't want to do it for a while. But I, um, I started rewatching a lot of the old Peanuts specials, and my mind changed completely because uh, a because um, the music on there is so kick ass, but b um, I was started to realize how much the music brought on an, another element, uh, an element to it which is not all that obvious, which is. Um, and it's a little abstract, like that watching those specials, uh, it creates a mood of where it's, it's uh, this is not just a cartoon. This is a place where you want to go hang out. And that uh, it had, it has an atmosphere to it, which is, um, it's, a, it's an attitude and an atmosphere that you want to take with you. And I was just thinking, there, there's really something to this. And so I started diddling with it. And um, strangely enough, I found that, um, I found that um, coming up with a piece of music, writing a piece of music when before the script is finished can sometimes help me decide where I want this thing to go. And so it's just, it's just another element to kind of bring into, uh, to bring into the whole thing and mix it up. That's really interesting, and the the music is almost constant in the Peanuts specials, and it's damn loud too. Yeah, no, and, it's a primary sound yeah, element. Yeah, and I'm thinking too of like the Pink Panther cartoons. It's like the cartoons were essentially based on the music. Yes, the music and the title sequences to those Pink Panther movies, but the theme is just repeats constantly. Mm-hmm. in those cartoons and the cartoon action escalates in time with the music and it's all just a beautiful wedding mm-hmm. and it's a real cool place to hang out yeah like you say that's really interesting and i liked what you said before too about sort of half making the the movie and then discovering a bunch of things and then going back and making the real one it's almost like you're doing a first draft of the video well well you, you could you start looking and thinking at it thinking about it visually so you you could discover so many things and can really clarify what you're trying to say right well sometimes it just is um I, I don't know if it's really a first draft it's um it's more of like that uh, just finding like you know the um uh the first few paragraphs of a story you know and uh because it's not really a draft because i don't redo like you know i won't go and redo the drawings it's just that like i've got i've gotten it started first off like you know getting getting something started is like you know the best way to make sure you finish it that uh i had an an um a drawing teacher in art school the boston museum school and his thing was always um uh no art just start and he would always he would always say that. that's great advice uh, yeah and it's so- was that your education? You were sort of trained as an artist? Yeah. And I mean, um, I don't think it's really any great surprise that the things that I really um, did in school was um, drawing, video, and performance art. Those were my three things that I did the most of. <laughs> and here you are. If you had advice to offer for somebody who wanted to start making some videos on YouTube now, what would that be? Um... I'm not really too sure because I mean that uh, I am very well aware that um, my you, much of my YouTube audience uh, that uh, that I have a, a foothold because of when I started, and um, that uh, so somebody who was who was uh, trying to do something now, um, I wouldn't know what to tell them because I mean I would almost feel like it, it would this is basically the equivalent of trying to. Um, give advice to a kid from Louisiana who wanted to go to Los Angeles to start a heavy metal band in 1987. You know, <laughs> would you recommend they uh, discover a new medium? 
Um, because that's kind of where you were. You were at the start of the video online. And it is, you know, I was at the start of that as well. It was the start of the, at the internet. And when you're one of the first and one of the few, it's much easier to succeed. Yeah. And it's very daunting, the idea now of trying, how do you break through? Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a better way to think about it. As far as ad- advice is concerned, I mean, like that, uh, that, um, uh, first, I mean, that, the, the very simple things like that, um, uh, a big, a, a certainly a big epiphany for me when I was in school was, uh, I remember coming, um, back from the, uh, I was going, I took my lunch break to go and buy art supplies over at Utrecht, um, up on Huntington Avenue before I went back to school. And I went and I'd spent like maybe about 50 bucks on like paints and like pencils and whatever. And I just felt horrible, you know, because I had spent so much money on, on like these art supplies. And it just was like this cold sensation was running down me and just like thinking, I'm never doing this again. I am never spending a lot of money on supplies again, because if I am dumb enough to go to art school, I had better be at least smart enough to learn how to work cheaply. And so that, um, after that, I mean, obviously I used the supplies and whatever, but after that, I just, I never did it again. And I just started like, uh, bringing the most rudimentary things to art class like that. Um, I would bring like, you know, like charcoal, very like inexpensive paper. And like I, that, um, but I wouldn't buy pastels. I'd buy crayons. You know, I would just, I would get most of my stuff at Toys R Us after that, because, um, I just never, I never wanted to be in a position where I wouldn't be able to make something because I didn't have the funds. And so, I mean, I think that that's, that's something that I would probably, probably say, because I think that, um, there, I think there's a lot of people who are under the impression that you really need to do something that's very, uh, that's very expensive, but, um, but it takes a big investment. Absolutely. And it, and it w- might, um, and it might keep you from doing something else. Well, it might keep you from doing something that's really honest and genuine. Absolutely. There's more pressure than to deliver and to get revenue returned and all that sort of stuff. And you might like, you know, start going into the infamous, infamous Bono syndrome and start thinking you needed to do something very important Oof. instead of something that's a little bit off the cuff, you know, or just fun. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so th- that's something, but, um, but also, I mean, I, I think that just, um, I was watching this, this wonderful little clip of David Bowie giving advice where he was talking about just, um, about never really playing to the, to the crowd. Yeah, that seems to have been a, a big through line for you. Yeah. It's like being true to what you want to say more than trying to appeal. Well, I mean, frankly, that um, I kind of, <laughs> I sort of think that um, that I started getting into telling a lot of the stories in the first place just simply because um, I, I didn't feel like that as a conversationalist, I was really ever all that articulate. I was one of those people who whenever... I was in a conversation. I would always walk away from the, even if I was talking like a mile a minute for maybe about two hours, I would walk away from the conversation feeling like I never said a damn thing that I really actually felt or meant. And um, so I thought that it was just, um, I wanted to kind of get a lot of that stuff out, but it would like, you, if you couldn't do it in sort of a verbal conversation way, you know, hanging out with other people that this, this was another, another method. And, um, that, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that, uh, that a lot of people who I know who are, you know, that who are good artists are very shitty conversationalists and, uh, people who are good actors, it's the same thing because, you know, that they, just have this other method of of self expression and like that uh, so when I see somebody who has an obvious talent in another way and but isn't a very good conversationalist, I'm just sort of like that now it makes so much sense to me. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, <laughs> yeah, because I'm one of those people <laughs> well, uh continued success to you, Lev. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you, thanks very much. It's been a blast talking to you too. Thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. I hope you'll subscribe and leave a review on iTunes if you like what you hear here. And check out howtowritefunny.com for tons of free tips and resources on comedy writing. I'm sure you're going to love it. That's howtowritefunny.com.